Welcome to Putting Your Business Plan to Work. My name is Dr. Charlie Hall, holder of the Allison Chair in International Floriculture here at Texas A&M University. This module is developed specifically for the Small Acreage Horticultural Crop Program here within Texas AgriLife Extension Service. In developing business plans today, it's important that we know the need for planning. So that's the topic of this module to start off with, is we're going to very specifically at why should we plan. Then secondly, why is it important to have a vision for the future? After all, you're a small business. Why do you need to be concerned about having a vision? Well, we're going to talk about that. And then lastly, what is the essence of strategic business planning that will make your vision happen. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that I'm talking about strategic business planning. I'm not just talking about developing a business plan starting from A to Z following the old traditional model. I'm thinking about you operating uh, your planning process strategically and developing strategic goals so that you will uh, enable uh, your firm to succeed even in times of economic downturn. So first of all, why plan? Well, as we know, sometimes if we don't have a map and we're on a journey, we can get lost. The same way as in business. If you don't have uh, a plan that serves as your compass, then you really don't have anything that's guiding you along the, uh, the pathway to success or, or vice versa. And then secondly, we need to plan because it, it generates dollars for us. You know, there's a lot at stake. And so we don't want to uh, neglect our business by not planning properly. And again, we have different alternatives available to us uh, during the course of operating our business. And sometimes the, the road may fork to the left, sometimes to the right. We have equally good alternatives. And so we have to make a decision about which one of those are good for our company. And then sometimes there are time periods when the, the economy is suffering, there's an economic downturn, and if we have done a, a good job of strategically positioning our business, no matter how big we are, then we will ensure our survival in the long run. And then most markets uh, are maturing. And uh, I developed a graph there in the lower left-hand corner uh, demonstrating the average annual growth rate in the green industry. And you can see that that industry is maturing. And so in a maturing marketplace, it's all the more imperative that you plan properly. And then you can see that um, in this graph of U.S. births uh, from 1905, that the generations directly uh, following the boomers are Gen X and Gen Y. Of course, there's 11 million fewer Gen Xers than there were Boomers. So automatically, that means that the market is shrinking at least for the next 10, 15 years until Generation Y gets into its peak spending uh, time period of their lives. And so it's even more imperative to plan because of that. And then there's a lot of costs that are associated with even a small acreage business and so you want to make sure that you've properly accounted for all those costs and, and particularly in terms of your pricing strategies and that's all a part of strategic business planning and then lastly um, in, in today's markets we're seeing a lot more hyper competitive activity and what I mean by that is that the competitive advantages that folks have relied upon for the last two decades are no longer the competitive advantages that are going to carry them into the future. So all of these things lend itself to us developing a strategic business plan. Another point to be made here is that everyone in the firm, everyone in the, I don't care if it's just a husband and wife in, in a small business effort, everyone should be involved in the planning efforts. And I think Eisenhower said it best when he said, plans are nothing. But planning is everything. And I think what he meant by that is the fact that when people are engaged in the planning process, they have buy-in. And that process of getting buy-in is what you're really looking for 
in terms of uh, directing your business over the long run. Now in traditional business planning, there's an executive summary and you have a description of your company and you describe the management structure and you talk a little bit about the market and the competition and the, why your product or service is better and then your marketing and service plans for actually selling the product or service and then the financial plan associated with it. Well, again, we, we've relied on this type of format, particularly when we've gone to Mr. and Ms. Banker and we needed some money or capital for our business. And then they've asked us for a business plan. This is the format that we've traditionally followed. I'm not disregarding that. I'm just saying a better model is one that we assess the external environment in which we're operating in and we access our own business in terms of the resources that we have access to, the capabilities that we have internally in terms of creating value for our end consumers, and then formulating a very articulated vision and the goals associated with that vision and putting in place an overarching strategy and an implement, implementation plan in order to accomplish that vision and supporting goals. And then lastly, and this is a step that most people tend to leave out because it's not a lot of fun, we have to evaluate our efforts, monitor our business performance, and then adjust our strategy depending or our maybe even our implementation plan according to those uh, results that we've been monitoring. So let's take the first step. If you look at assessing the external environment, there's a lot of things that can impact our small acreage horticultural business. And economics is just but one of those. And there's other factors that affect the industry environment, such as the socio-cultural aspects of our, of our, um, the marketplace. That is, what's the ethnicity? What's, uh, what, what are things that are changing the dynamics of our marketplace? You know, a few years ago, uh, salsa uh, surpassed ketchup as the number one condiment sold in America. Well, that's reflective of some social cultural uh, changes within our country. Then there's the global considerations. We can't we can't neglect the fact that we live in a global economy and becoming all the more so every day. Technology is always changing. Certainly the political environment and the, and the legal ramifications that, that come about from who's in office uh, are constantly changing. And then our traditional demographic factors such as age and income and, and gender and so forth, all of these things affect our industry environment. And when we're thinking strategically about the future of our business, we need to consider these types of influences over our small acreage business. Of course, we'd be very remiss not to consider the impacts of weather. And this is a very interesting dynamic because uh, before now, we've not had a clear picture of how weather influences us. But interestingly, GDP, which is gross domestic product, and it's the most common measure by which we uh, reflect our country's uh, production, GDP can fluctuate plus or minus 4% in any given year just simply because of weather. And so that's an 8% swing in total in our nation's productivity simply based off of weather. Now in agriculture, it's even more sensitive. There's a 12.1% swing, plus or minus. So any, any given year, you'll see a, a range of 24% in terms of, of our agricultural sector's productivity just because of weather. So we know that uh, in horticulture, we're greatly dependent on the weather. We've never really measured that uh, to a great extent before but now we have a little better idea. So we have to account for that and particularly mitigate the, the risk associated with weather, such as drought, uh, particularly the use of drip irrigation and other water conservation tools can help us mitigate that risk. So that's one example. 
Now let's switch gears and, and think instead of externally, let's think internally. And we have to look at the resources and capabilities within our firm. That is, are we located near uh, substantial water resources? Are we uh, or other natural resources that are advantageous to our business? Are we located next to high income population areas? What, what are the things that are impacting uh, our business from a resource standpoint? And then how adept, uh, how, what are our capabilities in performing uh, in generating the products that our end consumers are going to want? And then is there value being created? And that's what I mean by this value chain analysis. We need to look at all the way from the research and development that we do. And you may say, well, I don't do any research and development. Sure, every business does the research and development, big and small. You're always looking at new products, new services, and that's, that's all R&D. So every activity that we perform, all the way from the research and development activities through pr producing our crops, through marketing and sales and ultimately the, the customer service that we provide to the customer generates value. Or if it doesn't generate value, we need to ask ourselves, self, how can I improve that activity so that uh, I'm uh, perhaps lower the cost of doing that activity so that there is value that's created? And by value, I mean the benefits derived from that activity exceed the cost of, of doing that activity. Now, we all are concerned about the performance of our company. And if we consider to where we are right now, our current path, we may be in a situation where we're increasing sales or what have you, but it may be in spite of our managerial talents, and we, we may want uh, to move from where we are today to uh, perhaps a more aggressive goal where we would end up in the future. Of course, there's a gap between where we are today and where we want to be. And hopefully, each one of us challenges ourselves to be better and to, to be a more profitable business, to be a, a business that contributes more to the local community, and so forth and so on. So how do we fill that gap? You know, how do we close the gap? Well, first of all, we got to find out where we are currently and with respect to how, uh, how well we're satisfying customer needs in terms of the competition that's in the marketplace, the general market situation, what is our goal in terms of where we want to be one to three years down the road, and we used to say five to ten, but things change so fast now that we have to consider that we're in a rapidly changing market and only plan for a one to three year horizon. Then we evaluate our firm relative to the marketplace, so we do a SWOT analysis, and S stands for strengths and W stands for weaknesses, O for opportunities and T for threats. You know, what are our strengths and weaknesses in our firm relative to the opportunities and the threats that are in the marketplace? And then we start down the path that's going to lead to our goal and developing very clear and precise action steps to move forward. Now, Jim Collins wrote the book, Good to Great, and it's been met with mixed uh, emotions in the, in the, in the literature. But I think it's important that he studied several companies uh, over a period of t 15 years and looked at those that, whose, whose performance outperformed other companies. And uh, he said that the companies that became great on average outperformed the comparison companies by 700% over 15 years. Well, what made them different? That's, that's the key. He said that the only demonstrable variable that drove the shift from being good to being great was vision and leadership. All right, those two aspects, vision and leadership. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about vision and in particular and why that's important. Because a well-conceived vision consists of two parts, a core ideology which is a definition of what your company stands for and why it exists. It's unchanging through time. But then the second part of the well-conceived vision is this envisioned future and what our company aspires to be in the future. What do we want to achieve? What do we want to create? You know, what's your uh, raison d'etre? What's your reason for being? And again, 
even a small acreage horticultural business needs to consider why are we in this? Why do we do what we do? And again, this is what that looks like, that core ideology and that envisioned future, which is made up of four different parts, the core values, the core purpose, a 10 to 30 year BHAG, and I'll explain what that is in just a second, and then a very vivid description of what that future looks like. Now, let's go through each one of those individually. Core values are those essential and enduring tenets that represent our genetic code. They're timeless, uh, but they, they provide a very guiding um, uh, principle for us. They don't require us to justify those to anybody else. They're, they are why we do what we do, what is important to us. They're, we have to be authentic. We have to uh, be realistic with ourselves. And the, the really neat thing about core values is that they reflect your passion. You know, what, what is it that's, that if you were to do some other business, if you were to wake up tomorrow morning and you say, I'm going to move into a completely different direction and open up a different business, chances are the same core values would go with you into that new venture. All right, so these are things that are innate about you. Your, your core values, and it could be related to ethics, your moral behavior, it could be the way that you conduct business. It, it, those are the founding principles of your business. All right, this is your core purpose. That's the second part of your vision. What is your reason for being? What, what is it that's motivating you? All right, and this core purpose really captures the soul of your business. It's, it's forever pursued and it's never reached. It can't be fulfilled. It's that North Star that's guiding you. And a good way to, to figure out what your core purpose is is those five whys. And what I mean by five whys is you say, if I were to ask you, what business are you in? Then you you tell me what it is. And I'd say, well, why are you in that business? And chances are you'd give me a, a reason. I'd say, but why? Do you do this? And, and we'd answer that we ask ourselves five whys to every answer that we give, and we really get down to the real motivation of why we're in business. Now, I told you uh, to explain to you what BHAG was, and BHAG is Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. And this is a commitment to a huge, daunting challenge in front of us. And again, even a small acreage horticultural business needs to set a big, hairy, audacious goal. It's clear. It's compelling. It acts as a catalyst for developing uh, unity among your team. There's a very clear finish line. It's tangible. It's energizing. And it takes little or no explanation. People get it. And they got a good example there on the very bottom of this slide. C. Raker and Sons, they're a greenhouse operation, and their big, hairy, audacious goal is that our achievements will be the benchmark by which other companies measure themselves. Now, this is a greenhouse firm, and they, they don't just be the, the benchmark by which other greenhouses measure themselves, but the benchmark by which other companies in total will measure themselves. Now, that's a big, hairy, audacious goal. And then lastly, there's that vivid description. You know, if I were to get on the first floor with you in, in an elevator and ask you what business are you in, where do you want to be, this is that elevator spiel, that elevator speech that you would give me by the time that we got to the 10th floor. I would know exactly what business you were in and why you were passionate about it. And I'd have a very clear mental image of what, the, what, you're, what you want to become and I could get a sense of your conviction, all right? You're creating a picture for me. You're telling me the story associated with your business. And every business out there, particularly small acreage horticultural businesses, have stories about why you're in, why you're doing what you're doing. And I think it important that you tell the story, particularly to your end consumer. Now, here it is all together. 
your core purpose and core values and big BHAG and vivid description. And I used a company that's totally outside the horticultural industry as an example. It's called Granite Rock, and they, they sell gravel. And they, they sell marble and other stone and so forth. But their basic business is gravel. All right, and, and I chose a gravel company because if a gravel company can get it and, and think strategically in terms of this, their vision, then certainly a small acreage horticultural business can, can do the same thing because you have a whole lot more glamorous product than gravel. All right, so Granite Rock's core purpose was to provide ever-improved products of lasting value. Right now, that that's, that catches you right there. Their core values were integrity, continuous improvement, customer satisfaction, people growth and development, and that is people within the firm, and then job ownership. People took ownership of their job, even the most menial tasks. They understood how it related to the company's goals. And so they became more motivated. So these were their core purpose and core values. And their big, hairy, audacious goal was to become a role model, total quality company by the standards of any industry, not just in the gravel industry, but in any industry. And their vivid description, and they stated theirs in terms of the comparison to other well-known companies, they wanted to be as people-oriented as Hewlett Packard. They wanted unsurpassed customer service as in Nordstrom's. They wanted con to have a continuously uh, continually gaining market share despite the fact that they charge a price premium on all their products. Okay, they were the highest priced alternative in the marketplace and yet they wanted to gain market share. They wanted to be studied by business schools as far as their their business strategies and they wanted to win the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. Well, those last two things have occurred. In fact, this is this company I've used as a case study in my classes here at Texas A&M. They've been studied by business schools, and they have won the Quality Award. Now, this is a grapple company. Now, again, I use this to emphasize the fact that you, as a horticultural business, have a much more appealing and glamorous product and so this should be just second nature. Now in terms of strategy there's basically three different strategies that any business, horticultural business and otherwise, has available to it. We can become the low-cost operator and play the volume game which unless you're a big business I wouldn't recommend it. And by nature, this is the small acreage horticultural program, so we're, we're addressing small businesses here. So really, number two is more what you want to be about. You want to differentiate yourself in some way. You want to specialize by the products that you're growing, the, uh, the services that you're offering, the customers that you're serving within a certain geographic area maybe, but you want to be different in some form or fashion in terms of quality, price, service, convenience, selection, those dynamics, you want to make sure that you can differentiate yourself. And then lastly, uh, you can increase your value, customer's value by horizontal or vertical coordination. All this means is that you develop alliances with other producers so that you can, all, you can, you may not be big, but you can act bigger through these types of alliances. Now, last step in the strategic business planning process is the monitoring and control. And here, we'll start with, you have to determine what your critical success factors in the upper left-hand side of this slide. You've got to decide what you're going to measure and establish standards so that when you measure it and you're monitoring performance, you ask yourself, does my performance match these standards? And if it does, then you just keep on monitoring. But if it doesn't, you have to ask yourself, is it an operations problem? And if it is, you correct that. But if it's not, you may be in a situation where you need to revise your strategy. And of course, all of these success factors may change depending on the, the situation internally, 
your financial capabilities, the customer base that you're selling to, how innovative you are, and how able your business is to learn from your mistakes. So this is a snapshot of the monitoring and the control process within your business. It's just a fancy diagram for asking yourself what's important in terms of the measuring standards, measuring my performance, am I matching up to those standards? You know, if I'm not, is it something that I'm doing wrong internally, or is it something that's changed in the marketplace? And I need either way, I've got to make changes. So that's the monitoring control process. Now, usually, effective daily execution is not necessarily a problem. I mean, we're horticultural growers or producers or business owners, and and you know, doing what we do comes natural. We like doing it. But sometimes our strategy may become dated over time. The market may change. So we've got to adjust our sales, so to speak, and change with the uh, uh, winds of change at the same time executing our strategy. And that's the big challenge, for particularly for small businesses. And you see this little box down here at the bottom of this slide, KSFs is Key Success Factors. And we need to know what those, what are the things that require us to be successful and build the right teams with the right skill sets, with the right mindset, that's what I mean by culture there, with the proper communication channels and that everybody's on the same page in terms of sharing those metrics where we, we're, we're open with how our firm is performing. So then we got to ask ourselves at the very end, going back to Jim Collins' book, when you, we may be good, but are we great? As a small acreage horticultural business owner, what is it you're trying to convey to people? What, what is it? Why would they buy from you? That's the question. So, you know, Jim Collins relates this to the hedgehog concept, and the fox is always trying to catch the hedgehog. Meniticulus said the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing, and that's how to survive. Because the hedgehog would just roll itself in a ball, and it's got all these uh, uh, pointy spines like a porcupine, and the, the, the hedge involves being uh, better at a specific thing, fewer things, and being known for it. As you can know, uh, a little about a lot, or you can know a lot about a little. And the hedgehog knows a lot about uh, survival. Your business should know a lot about that thing that's creating the value proposition for your company. And the value proposition is even more important than ever. Now, I talked about those things that, that impact your value, the, your end consumer's values in terms of price, quality, and convenience, service, and it, now there's other dimensions such as the entertainment value, and many small acreage horticultural businesses have gone to agritourism efforts to provide a level of entertainment for their customers that they may draw to their to their farm, etc. So there's a lot of different things that are part of this value equation for our customer. And of course, the shopping occasion. Are they coming to us just because we're convenient? Or are they coming to us because they need a solution to a need or a problem? And then, of course, you know, what level of need do they have for our, for our products or services? Are we simply providing things that enable them to survive, like food and shelter? Or are we providing things that are part of those higher order needs, like self-esteem? or self-actualization. And I think that's where horticulture is, all, that's what we're all about in horticulture, is that we, we satisfy those higher order needs. There's this plant connection with man that's inherent since the beginning of time. And, and, and we, we must appeal to that, and if we do it successfully, if we differentiate ourselves in terms of any of these things in our value proposition, then what we'll find is that we're able to charge a higher price because we're essentially, in economic terms, making our demand more inelastic. All right, I'll finish with a quote from uh, a good friend of mine, Carl Mays, who's a motivational speaker. He said, those who see the invisible 
can do the impossible. Now, as a small acreage horticultural business, I'm encouraging you to think strategically about what the vision is for your company and, and monitor the external environment, act, assess your, um, your resources and your capabilities in terms of your internal value chain, and to really reach in terms of what that, that big, hairy, audacious goal is for your company and what does that envisioned future look like and to really spend a lot of time in thinking about the future. And then lastly, for more information, I invite you to, uh, to go to my blog. It's called Making Sense of Green Industry Economics. And there I uh, provide even more information that may be of value to small acreage horticultural business.